and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and today we have the pleasure of talking with Ann Williams Isom, the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone, supporting the 12,500 children who live in a 97 square block of New York City, many with some pretty substantial challenges. Ann, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Carol. You know, there, there are those who would say that is an enormous task. You're talking about 12,500 kids, and you also deal with about 13,000 parents or yes. families of, of, of these children. Yes. So tell us a little bit about it. So you know my, uh, the founder and the pioneer of this work, Jeff Canada. And yes. for Jeff, it was always not about what we could do for some children or for hundreds of children. He wanted to do something for thousands of children so that we could prove to this nation that it's not the kids that can't be successful. It's about us adults really putting a focused, innovative strategy in place to make sure that all children can be successful. So he decided to do 97 oh. blocks <laughs> and, and really had a strategy, you know, with, you know, first with 3,000 young people, then with 7,000 young people, and then with over 10,000 young people to really put a pipeline of services in place for them. So now this is 110th Street to 142nd. Correct. From 8th to, to Madison. Madison. Yes. Madison Avenue. That's yes. a huge chunk. It's huge. We probably serve about 80% of the children that live within the zone. And when you say serve, you're talking about from zero to college and beyond. From the time they're in their mama's bellies uh, to the time they're about 24 or so when they go into college, we really have found through this work that it wasn't enough just to get them to have a high school diploma and it wasn't enough just to get them to the front door of college, that with these young people, they're so vulnerable, have a lot of challenges that we wanted to stay with them to and through college. And, you know, it's a community strategy also. So that's why we really do work with a lot of the parents and the community because Jeff wanted to create a, a community that people would want to raise their children children in and where right. kids can have the kind of life that all children in America should have. And now you were chosen uh, and actually groomed. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, really sensible leadership changes. Yeah. Uh, so you came to work with Jeffrey. Yeah, so um, I am a lawyer by training and I worked at the Administration for Children's Services right here in New York City like where we did for 13 right? years yeah. doing work in child welfare and really learning what it takes to, to support the most vulnerable New Yorkers and I met Jeff there. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next in my career, I was thinking about how do I take the, the concepts and the theories that I've learned in law school and in government and apply them to a community to see what large scale changes we could make. And Jeff tapped me to come on board to be his um, COO. Right. And so my idea was always like, I'm just going to learn from the greatest. I'm going to really get trained. I'm going to see what this practice looks like on the front lines. How does one fundraise? How does one look at the data to see whether or not we're really making changes? And he asked me then after a while, because he and the board had always been thinking about sustainability, right. that we want right. to be here for years, right? So if I have a baby that's starting in baby college right now as a, as a one-year-old, we want to be here those years, 19 years from now when that little one is graduating from college. You were telling me earlier that two thirds of the funds come from private sources. Yeah. So. We have a pretty incredible board of directors, a, a group of really outstanding Americans who have been dedicated to this idea of, of ending generational poverty. You know, we don't say that we're just an education um, program or that we do after school programs. We say that we want to end generational poverty for a group of children and we want to be that example for the nation. And so they have been very supportive to the mission. And then we, we also have some, obviously some government funding, Carol, because it would take the private sector, it takes government and communities working together to make the kind of changes that we're talking about. I want, to, I want you to answer the question about your uh, place in black America. And I'm looking for the reasons of how you and why you came to be doing what you're doing now. Yeah. Uh, ending poverty uh, in, in this block of, uh, <laughs> of, of Harlem. So you, you were born? I was, I was born here right. in, um, in Queens. Um, we're both Queens we're, girls. We're Queens girls, <laughs> yes. Um, born of West Indian um, American, um, West Indian parents from Trinidad and Tobago. I was telling you earlier, my mom is the youngest of 14. And um, so her mom died about a month after um, she was born. And so she, the family couldn't take care of her. So she was raised by the nuns um, in Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. She got a, a great education and then came to the United States with this in pursuit, literally, of the American dream. And came So here. you said she was a nurse. She, she was. So, yeah. So 
and and had three kids. She had four. There's four of theirs. I'm four the of youngest of four. Three right. older brothers. <laughs> yes, right. I'm very spoiled. <laughs> it explains a lot about me and my personality. <laughs> but yeah, so this idea of of pursuing her dreams. You know, it was very funny. I was having a conversation with her the other day and she was like, Trinidad felt too small for me. And I was like, well, mommy, what were you thinking about? She was like, I was reading all these books and I wanted more. And so I think that she came here thinking that she wanted more for herself. She wanted a family. And at that time, she actually, when she came here, she had two young children and was pregnant with my brother, Stephen. Right, right. And I met her. I saw her yes. at the Wendy Hilliard celebration. We were all there. Yes. And that's where I like got a hold of you and said, I want to talk to you. Wendy's been on the, been yeah. on the show, but the Wendy Hilliard gymnastics program. One of our partners, one right. of the things that we are really serious about is that we want our children to have access to high quality um, services and programs. And so we have partnered with Wendy Hilliard, who does gymnastics for us up at the Armory. We have a, a full scale Healthy Harlem program where we're trying to end childhood obesity. And we actually have been making a lot of progress and we're going to have some stuff to share with the nation soon about that. But we'll partner with um, Harlem Hospital. We partner with the YMCA. A lot of people in the area so that we can make sure that our kids are getting the highest quality access to arts and music and gymnastics and all of those things. Right, right. So I want to get back to you now. Okay. Okay, I keep bringing, I want to bring you, <laughs> because so that you were the child of a single mother yes. household. So yes. you experienced some of what? So, you know, once she came to this country, my mom was a victim of domestic violence. And I say to people that, but for have her having a career, but for have her having the support of the Catholic school that we went to and, and the church, I'm not sure where she would have been, if we would have been homeless, if we wouldn't have been able to have access to a great education. And so her strength and determination, her focus on education and the community supports around her allowed her to be able to, you know, keep our little house in Queens right. and to grow up. And for, you know, my oldest brother was a pediatrician, I was telling you, and, right. and all of my brothers are successful and we have families. And I think a lot a lot of that was about what I saw if even when you're going through troubles as a child, being able to have consistency and stability and caring adults in your life to support you through that. So it, it takes a special kind of person, though, I mean, which you are because we were in the green room earlier today and you got a text from one of your kids looking for a place to live. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, I, yeah, I don't know where that comes from. I feel like that is part of my training, which is that you have to do this work one child at a time. We can have policies, we can have the ideas and the strategies, but if you're not able to be connected, because that's the thing that makes the difference in these young people's lives. Everyone's like, what's the secret sauce? Is it a particular curriculum? Is it a particular program? It's not that. You have to love them as you would love your own children. So when I get a text from a young person that's like, Miss Ann, I have my housing voucher, but I need to get support, I'm able to say, well, we have a program called Single Stop, can so-and-so, let, let me put you in contact with that person and follow up with me and let me know um, what's happening. Right. So knowing that there are so many young people out there that are disconnected, that don't have somebody in their life that, that they can count on, I think that that's what the Harlem Children's Zone is about. We are trying to surround these mm -hmm. children by caring adults. And uh, our motto is doing whatever it takes. And you know, as mothers, there's nothing that we're like, oh yeah, we're just gonna give them that one program when they're you know, in fourth grade and then they're good kids the redundancy that we build into it and that pipeline that we want to stay with them and I if anything's the secret sauce I think love is right well I was so impressed to know that she had your text <laughs> you know your number that she could get right to the head of the Harlem Children's Zone and say I have no place to live right well I think that's really that says who we are as an organization that there's nothing that I'm too busy doing that I can't be available for a child and I really try to model that for my staff so, so let's go back to some of the, uh, of the programs. You have the Baby College, and that starts again, as you say, in the mommy's womb yes. from that point on. So you're talking to pregnant women and girls. And dads. And dads. Let's not forget the dads. And okay. it was a program that actually is one of our earliest programs. And we started it at the suggestion of some residents who said that they felt like there wasn't enough going on in terms of parenting and healthy parenting in our community. We got Dr. Brazelton to come in oh, and sure. to help us. You know, we, we're very much into looking at what the science says about brain development and about early childhood. And then we put a little bit of uh, Harlem flavor on it and created the Baby College, which is one of our longest standing programs 
programs. We've had over 6,000 graduates from it so far. Wow. So you have people now that you will see on the trains and the buses reading to their children, singing, understanding the importance and difference between discipline and punishment, understanding what healthy food choices and nutrition look like, and feeling like they have some support as they go through this, you know, most important job of being a parent. So, so you were describing some of it earlier as going out and knocking on doors yeah. to find them, and then they come to you for... So that's a really key part, right? Because yeah. sometimes if you're isolated and if you feel like, oh, I have this baby, I don't know what to do, if you're frustrated, we go out and try to find the most vulnerable families. We don't just put up our, our storefront and say, come to us. Mm -hmm. And so many of the people who are doing outreach have been through the programs themselves, are absolutely probably residents of Harlem or similar communities, and so that people can relate to them. And who wouldn't want to sign up for a baby college to have their, <laughs> their parents come there? And then it's also a way to make parents feel good about parenting. You you know, right. there are so many struggles. We talked about domestic violence. We talk about mental health issues that are untreated. We talk about not having a job, maybe not being with your partner, high levels of postpartum depression. We want to say we care about you and you are the best first teacher in your child's life. So baby college becomes that door that we can open for families and then stay with them for actually the rest of their child's life. If, if that's what they would allow, that's what we want. Yeah. And I, and I guess the uh, preschool now availability has helped a lot. Huge. And so having this pipeline, so now my little one is three years old, what do I do next? And what do, how does that early childhood and sort of, we have a program, we call them GEMS. So they are our precious GEMS. They come from eight o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. It's a room of 20. Many of those little ones haven't had access to education before. So this is their first exposure. We see that about 17% of them are come live in homeless shelters. About over 20% of them have some special needs. So we really, again, Again, we want to get them in early. We want to get them the supports that they need. We want to tell parents what's, you know, how can they be educational advocates in their child's life. And so we have family workers there. We have the supports that we need. Putting the scaffolding in early, Carol, because we feel like that's the best way to have great long-term outcomes for children. Right. Now, you have two charter schools. Yes. A bit of controversy around charter schools these days, but you also supplement the work that's going on in the public schools yes. in the area. There are, what, seven elementary schools that you work with? Correct. Correct. And, and the two charter schools. Correct. And what yeah. and the other thing that people don't know, so I serve over 800 young people in our middle school program, but they go to 64 different middle schools throughout New York City mm -hmm. and a thousand kids in our after school program for high school that attend over 170 different high schools. And for us, it's about the neighborhood. And as long as you live there, you are available to, to for our programs. And so our charter schools, even when they're fully enrolled, will only have 2,400 kids in it. That's a really small fraction in in terms of what we're doing. Jeff started the charter schools many years ago because he wanted to use that as sort of research and design about mm -hmm. what would it take to educate our young people if we could extend the day of school, if we could mm -hmm. extend the school year, if we could really have more flexibility in what, how we wanted to approach the curriculum. And we've been having great results about it. But for us, it's not a, a difference between charter school or traditional public school. It's about giving kids what they need and making sure that we're being supportive of parents. And you have about a thousand kids in college now. We do, which is I, you know, amazing. <laughs> so, so the children's zone is what is it about? Eight? You're into your 18th year we are, or so? We are or? about into our 16th year. 16th because year. Because in okay. 2020 we will be at 20 years of the Harlem okay. Children's Zone. So you, in 2020 you'll be celebrating that 20th. Yeah. So these are kids that have mostly come through all. So oh, the, many of the, your programs? Many of the programs. So the, the interesting thing about that is we have kids who have been with us from the very beginning, but you also can hop on the conveyor belt whenever you come right, to us. Right. We actually have a lot of immigrant families, mm -hmm. um, young people from Africa who have come in and may just join our program in high school. And we're going to help give them, you know, college readiness skills, give them exposures, recreation, our Healthy Harlem program, and try to support them while they're in college. Yeah. So you said that about two thirds of them are in four year schools, yes. which is great. Yeah. But that it is it's, not easy. It is not easy. Um, <laughs> anyone who has had a child in college knows that it's not easy, right? It takes a lot of work and, and they're becoming young adults. Mm -hmm. So being able to, you know, have some agency and independence while they're still so vulnerable. And, you know, Carol, many of our kids are first generation um, college goers. Mm -hmm. So we are finding that, yes, some of them uh, need more academic support so that they are not going in and having to take re remediation courses. But a lot of 
them, it's more about their internal. What are their self-esteem? Do they belong? The academic skills, do they know how to study? You know, when they come to me and say, oh, Miss Ann, I studied for two hours. I say, you mean for one subject, you know? <laughs> right, you know? Right. And so building while they're in high school and when they're with us, telling them what that looks like, because many of them don't have that example around them. Um, they get embarrassed or they feel like they're gonna fail so they don't tell um, us soon enough and they end up having to withdraw from a class or losing their financial aid. All of those things for, for our children are so, they are so vulnerable that we wanna keep our arms um, lovingly around them to make sure that they stay on track. So we started a, um, an office called our um, College Success Office that really takes a caseload of kids from all around the different countries and the places where they are and make sure that they are going to classes, that they have support. I mean, something as simple as sending them a care package, the, mm -hmm. the freshmen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just came to me. I was I, it, actually my daughter was like, Mommy, everybody's getting a care package except for me. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know what? If she feels that way, imagine what these, you know, 250 freshmen feel like if there's something, a shooting on campus or things that go on to send them a note to say, hey, we're here, making sure that they're connected and that we can give them, you know, a, a little job or a stipend or an internship while they're back. It's it really is, Carol, anything that we would do for our own children to make sure, sure that these young people can be successful. Sure. Now, you are, are also on the uh, advisory board of the Brothers Keeper that yes. uh, President Obama that started. Yes. Also controversial. There's also so much controversy in the world. I didn't realize but, that was controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's controversial from uh, from a, a huge uh, cadre of women who would say, hey, wait oh, a minute, what about the girls? Right. But at any rate, okay. so, so how, what's the status report on that project? I think that it's been, I've been really happy happy because I think the president brought together uh, people from around the nation to say what's working. We don't have to recreate the wheel in a lot of cases mm -hmm. and wanted to see what was working and to get some financial support so that we can look at those places all around the nation, especially in places where where some communities are, you know, generations are being lost. You hear what's happening in Chicago and, and people just sort of accepting it or Detroit. So what can we learn at other places that can be replicated? And as far as I can tell, there's been a lot of good um, work that's been going on and also, President Obama has done something particular to us, which is called the Promised Neighborhoods, where he's given money to communities who are sort of saying that they're modeling their work against the Harlem Children's Zone, working in schools, looking at early childhood, coming together, agreeing upon a set of data points that they're going to work together as a community to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel very hopeful, Carol, mm -hmm. because as we always say, we don't know what Plan B looks like. We think that you have to go into communities where families and children are needy. You need to give them the the resources and the support so that they can strengthen themselves, right? Government can't come in, we can't come in. We have to be there with them and really make sure that we are giving them what they need for their children. So so talk to us about the girls for a bit, you know, yeah. uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Crenshaw the, the, the lawyer, Columbia, yeah. you know, where you got your yes. law degree yes, as yes, well. Yes. Um, it has the Say Her Name program because she feels that all the women who have been killed by police officers, no one really knows their name yeah. other than Sandra Bland, which, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and she wants us all to take a look at what's happening with girls I against think, law enforcement. And, and just in general. In general. I think it's been fascinating because even I feel as a, an African-American woman, I was just having this conversation. I have a 24-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old daughter. And we were talking about whether or not we feel black first or we feel like we're yeah. women first. And so one daughter said she felt like she was black first. The other one said she felt like a woman first. And I was like, what is that conversation? And how have I led that for my own daughters and for the girls in the Harlem Children's Zone? And I think I haven't spent enough time thinking about gender and what that looks like. And sort of like, oh, black women are strong. I look at my mom. Right. They get it all done. They're fine. And, and they suffer in silence. And I was saying to you earlier, Carol, we did a, a, a survey of some of our girls who are, you know, killing it when it comes to their grades and mm -hmm. doing the right things and trying to make the right decisions. And then there was a question about happiness and whether they felt happy. And it was off the charts that the girls did not feel happy. And all of a sudden, these boys who really weren't doing so well academically or had these other risks were feeling quite confident. And I think we want to take a look at that at the Harlem Children's Zone and say, what more can we be doing? It is great now that, you know, they have a woman who is the CEO. I think that says a lot and what that means. But I think a lot more programming to talk about gender, to talk about what it means to be a, a woman and a woman of color. And so I think we're going to be paying much more attention to that. Yeah. And, forward. And, and there's also that concept of pipeline from school to prison. Yeah. 
how do you deal how do you deal with that so you know children's home? the way that we don't talk much about that because that's not our expectation for our young people and what we talk about is kids can't be in two places at one time so if they are in high quality programs if they have access to a great education if we're doing what we should be doing to keep them uh, engaged they won't go down that that other path and so there's actually a uh, map that I have in my conference room that shows the um, rates of incarceration in the zone from a couple of years ago. And the redder the area, the higher the rates of incarceration and the dark red that was in these 97 blocks, Carol. And we said, how much money do we put into that? I think at Rikers Island, it costs $167,000 a year to keep an inmate in there. What will it take to say that that's not what we want for our kids? We are gonna invest in early childhood programs. We're gonna give them high quality after school programs. We're gonna send them to college. We're gonna give them the scholarships and what they need. And we feel like that is what the Harlem Children's Zone is about, that kids can't be in two places at one time. They're not gonna be in that incarceration map. They're gonna be on that college map that's in that conference room with, uh, with us where we have mapped out where they all are and each one of them individually. We want them to come back to Harlem, which we know is a little difficult now because it's getting expensive <laughs> to live in Harlem. Yeah, my husband and I, <laughs> exactly, my husband and I live in Harlem. Thank God we bought there uh, 20 years ago. Okay. But we want them to come back to Harlem and live there so that we can change the trajectory of what people think about young children who grow up in Harlem today. But is that block of red getting less dark? It I is. We have uh, that same survey that we did when we looked about children who got into our charter school and who kids who didn't get into our charter school. We are seeing that our young people are at less rates. I don't think I think there's been one since I've been there that has been sort of incarcerated that we very quickly got a lawyer for that we very quickly got supports for and then was able to welcome back into the zone. I think it sees a difference. We, we are seeing a difference. The other thing, Carol, is we try to have a good relationship with the police officers mm -hmm. in our community, with the district attorney. We try to tell these kids the thing about no snitching, that if something happens, just the other day we had a young 21-year-old that was shot on the corner of 141st and 8th Avenue, like at 1.30 in the, in the afternoon. In the afternoon, right. Right? right. We don't want to normalize that for our kids. We don't want them to be so frightened or that the culture of the streets is you can't tell what happened or what is happening. We want to change that. And I think that's the part of changing the culture of the community to have more kind of, no, we, we deserve more. We can have better, better quality access to our lives so that our kids are not walking around traumatized, right? That's what we didn't talk about mental health that much. It's another thing, concentrated poverty mm -hmm. and the effects of long-term trauma. You know, I talked about growing up in a household where there was domestic violence. That affected my brothers and I, that feeling afraid, feeling like you could never be safe. How do we make kids feel safe and supported so that they can grow up to be healthy, thriving adults? So how do you assess the, uh, the children of uh, the Harlem Children's Zone now in terms of uh, feeling secure, uh, not frightened, uh, like in some areas of Chicago where you know, they literally could be gunned down any given morning of, of yeah. the week. You know, it's interesting. I thought you were going to ask a different question. Here at the Harlem Children's Zone, we have over 600 different goals that we look at to see whether or not children are being successful. So set that... 600? Oh, well, because we have the baby college, we right. have elementary programs, right. middle school, we have high school, we have preventive programs. So each one of those directors, when they meet with me at the end of the year, know what I'm expecting for them in terms of moving children towards a better trajectory. We're actually going to be doing some work um, soon. One of the things in a couple of years about how do we screen for trauma? Mm -hmm. There's all of this science now that right. we have out about toxic stress and not to label anybody and not to say any, any, you know, put labels on people, but saying if we could screen and if we could know better, would there be different things maybe that I would put into the curriculum at baby college mm -hmm. around what a mom should be doing so that we can sort of put some strategies and interventions in place before the trauma and the, uh, gets too much. So that's right. one of the things that we're going to be looking forward to. I'm really excited about that connection between, they call it adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and how many levels and experiences our kids have Right. And how do we help them work through that so that they can right. be healthy adults? And, and even what's passed on in the DNA, right. so to speak. Exactly. You know, traumatic stress. Exactly. Passed on through the through the DNA. Exactly. Right. So much. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> so much we have to, to have to learn here. I always ask my guests to uh, to finish the statement: "The power of the strength of Black America lies in." We're, how would you finish? I think the power and the strength of black America lies in our faith and our resilience and our ability as a people to get through anything that is thrown at us. And what I love about that is that we live 
as a community, not just for ourselves in this moment, but for our children. And so many people would say that you, you um, look at a community and judge it by how it treats its children. And I think I, it gives me hope that I know that with our faith and with our resilience, we are gonna be able to do something for thousands of young people in this country to make sure that we lift them out of poverty and that they have access to not just equality, but equity and the lives that they really need in order to be successful and to be able to have the American dream. Yeah, well, I'm so hopeful for those uh, kids in your, in your blocks, your 97 square block territory. Are people coming in uh, trying to replicate it oh my across the country? Yes. So we have those people that I talked about with the um, promised neighborhoods that um, President Obama has looked at about 20 different communities. But any given week, Carol, we have people from thousands of, of communities that are coming in and or you know hundreds of communities, even internationally, because everybody has a population that they feel like are disenfranchised and they don't know what to do anything with. And they come to us to look for some of those answers. Like I said, it's not so much magic. It's a concentrated um, effort. It's long term. It's doing and having the, the full pipeline and then a group of leaders that are really committed to um, yeah. these young people. I'm, I'm interested in your concept of leadership, too, because that, as we know, the transition from Jeffrey to you. But I think that um, uh, talk to us just for a moment about that, what's required in our neighborhoods, leadership-wise. I think um, we definitely need talent. I think sometimes, I, you know, I see it also sometimes with teachers. People may not think going into teaching is a lucrative job, or think people think that youth development or working in communities is not a lucrative job. I think that, you know, with, we have folks now that have Harvard MBAs. I have a Columbia Law degree. P I want people to think that this is the most important work that they can do, because I think what it requires when you have, you know, we have 2,100 employees, it's all the kids, all the fundraising, the work with the board, the ability to synthesize a lot of information and to take whatever comes at you, right? Every day, I don't know what, what's going to be happening. So this idea of being smart, but being compassionate, being able to understand these communities, being able to w work in many different worlds, those are the kind of skill sets that I think are really important in order to do this work. Well, I am so thrilled to be talking with you. Thank you for coming on the show. I'm impressed. I wanna come up and spend some time uh, with your kids uh, because I just think it really is the future. Uh, and I want to uh, sort of track you between now and 2020. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> And I just want to say thank you so much. I said I grew up, you know, having a great role model in oh. you. And so being able to be here has been just so important to me. So thank you so much for having well, me. I'm so proud of you. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Good. And we want to thank uh, you all out there as well for joining us today for our conversation with Ann williams Isom of the Harlem Children's Zone. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we will see you the next time.